<laughs> Alright, so uh, hi everybody, I'm Tim Nelson. I teach a course at Brown here called Logic for Systems. The deal with Logic for Systems is that we teach sort of introductory formal methods, reasoning and modeling uh, systems through constraint solving. Uh, what do I mean by that? I'm about to show you. Uh, but first, I want to make a point. When we talk about modeling systems, we're usually thinking about, in computer science, you know, systems-y systems, like algorithms and data structures and protocols and stuff like that. But there are other kinds of systems, too. And so if this were a class, which is not what I would do, is say, turn to your neighbor and spend a minute debating what it means to model the game of tic-tac-toe, or knots and crosses, depending on, on where you grew up. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to show you how I might do this in one of the first lectures of my course, and then we're going to get somewhere very interesting very quickly. Okay? Good. Okay. So, uh, what is a game of tic-tac-toe? I mean, I guess, I guess we have a notion of these three indices, right? Like 0, 1, 2, A, B, C, something like that. I guess we've got a couple of players, X and O. I guess that there are rules that... Oh, bother. I guess that there are rules that sort of dictate how those, how those players can interact on the board, and so on. So, um, is anybody here familiar with a language called Alloy? This is a constraint solving language called Alloy. Okay, so only a few of you. Um, Alloy... <laughs> how did everybody else get this to stay on? I can't eat my nervousness banana while I'm reattaching my microphone. Um, okay, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll try not to move. Sorry, that's unusual for me. Um, I was a constraint solver, and it's unique in a couple of different ways. It's great for teaching, I would argue, because it has a, a syntax that looks, at least on the surface, a lot like the object-oriented programming that some of our students are used to. It's got automation, so we're not working in a proof assistant. We're not focusing on proof. We're focusing on what the rules of the system are and what we want to learn about the, the, uh, the emergent behavior of those rules. And it has automatic visualization, which can make it much easier to comprehend those examples that come out of the constraint solver. Let me show you some, some examples of what I mean. You know, uh, oh no, let's see if I can type without dropping this. I've got an abstract type. <laughs> and I've got a couple instances of this type, right? I've got, uh, let me say, A, B, C. And I would go on, and I could define the same thing for players, X and O, and so on. Let me skip ahead a little bit, because I don't want to make you watch me live code. I said reasonably accessible syntax, right? Normally you would get a couple of, a couple of lectures on this. But I want to call out a couple of things. One is that the language is pretty intensely relational as soon as you reach a certain point, right? This says that there's a places relation on a particular cross product. Um, I can define helper predicates. I can define helper functions that are themselves relations. I've got dot in the language, right, so that I can talk about the places field of a board. But you know what that dot really is? Relational join. And so there's sort of this awkward point in class where, where I pull back the veil and we stop talking about objects and we start talking about relations. And ordinarily in Alloy, I get very little control over where that, that transition happens for each individual student. Everybody may have it happen at different times. Another thing that I want to call out is the, the fact that, sorry about that, that because I'm working in a general constraint solver, I can frame many differently shaped problems. So here, I'm asking Alloy to show well-formedness is preserved. So if I've got a tic-tac-toe board, and I'm not going to have uh, you know, X and O both moving in the same spot, that the transition system I just defined is going to preserve that invariant. So it's sort of verification-ish kind of, kind of property. But I can also say, hey, find me an example of a game where x wins. And then it finds me that concrete example. I can even check conjectures. You know, when I was very young, I thought, 
if, if I just move, if I go first, and I move in the middle of the tic-tac-toe board, I'm always going to win. <laughs> it turns out that that's false, and I can ask Alloy for an example instance that demonstrates that falsehood. Right? So this level of flexibility combined with the, uh, the great automatic visualization is great for sort of immediately getting a sort of uh, sense of usefulness for, for students. So I'm just going to execute this last one and prove my, my younger self right. And I'm going to click on instance, and I'm going to show you uh, the great automatic visualization. Oh, wait, there's a zoom in. It'll, it'll, it'll fix everything. Uh, oh, no. So the automatic visualization is great whenever the thing you're trying to visualize is a directed graph, which in many cases is the model that you want, but sometimes, as in the case of tic-tac-toe, it's really, really not. There are alternatives, like let's view everything like a, like a database table. Everything's a database table, right, because everything's relational and all that. This is also very difficult, right? I, if I wanted you to understand this trace of the game where X loses, I'd have to pull out a marker and we'd have to draw out the states and so on. And that's kind of a pain. So this is RacketCon. So, so why am I talking about this constraint-solving tool at RacketCon? Because uh, these are two of the reasons, right? The visualization issues combined with this awkward transition into relationality that have caused us to write up well, you know, originally our own uh, alloy clone in Racket that has become something rather more than that. Uh, and I will explain why in the time for me. All right, enough of alloy. So we have got a language called Forge. You can think of Forge as roughly approximating alloy. There's, there's some stuff that I wanted in it that alloy doesn't have. Um, however, because we implemented this in Racket, it was relatively straightforward to implement a language level for Forge. And so we've got a language level called uh, Froglet, which unfortunately I've, I, I broke the nice friendly name for. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so Forge Beginner Student Language, otherwise known as Froglet. Here's the deal with Froglet. The abstraction that we present to students is that of object-oriented programming. And in fact, is that where all of your fields are functions, rather than database tables, rather than sets. So, for instance, the board no longer has a places relation. It has a places field that's a partial function. And right there you might know, notice that, that you know, if, if that's an honest to goodness partial function, that is going to force preservation of the well-formedness. Right? You, it's a partial function. You're never going to have multiple entries at any given location. And we have like almost all of the same features of Alloy, right? We have counting, and we have we have logic, and we have helpers. Um, again, the, the the syntax is friendly, but but you don't have a whole a whole lecture to, to soak it in. One thing I want to I want to call out is um, one of the consequences of this language level is that students become forced to write explicit frame conditions in their transition relations. And so those of you who've worked in other modeling language may remember how sort of painful it is to, to forget a frame condition in, in your model checking model or something like that. Um, Froglet sort of forces them to, to do that. I was really scared when we started using this language last year. Um, why was I scared? Because it, it seems tremendously uh, restrictive not to let people use relations when, like, you know, you've been using relations for the past several years in class. It turns out almost every midterm project where students propose their own domain to model were just fine with functions in Froglet, and they didn't need relations. There was one group that was modeling Dijkstra's algorithm, and they ended up wanting relations to do the verification. Everybody else was able to get by on the midterm with Froglet. Um, what about visualization? Let me just, let me give this a run. We are, as, as, as you may notice, a little bit slower than alloy, but we're fixing that. <laughs> Wait, what? That's even worse. <laughs> Same problem, right? Directed graph doesn't make any sense. However, at the moment, mm -hmm. 
given a few lines of JavaScript, <laughs> there, there, is, there is a game where an X wins. I have never been clapped for for saying, and I just read a few lines of JavaScript before. <laughs> to get it from this audience is, is just mind-blowing. Um, I am extremely excited about, uh, about the talk that I just followed because, um, as you might imagine, now that I'm in Racket, I really want a DSL so that we can embed visual cues into the, into the underlying model. You know, let's put this in your proof, not just the output. Exactly, yeah. Um, and, and, and I hope we get to talk more <laughs> before Rocket finds. Um, but, but unfortunately, now it's, it's sort of straight JavaScript. But notice, uh, I, I no longer, I no longer have to suffer with showing students that uh, the tabular visualization. We can just skip directly here, and all of them uh, get to write their own visualizations that are domain specific for their term Ooh. projects. Ooh. Let me show you uh, one example of this. I think I've got time for one example. Uh, so I had some students model uh, uh, sort of the sequence diagrams that you see in crypto protocols. Uh, the, 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 that, that is directed graphs. You would think that, that you'd be able to sort of finagle it so that it looked better. Uh, uh, unfortunately, that turned out to be really difficult. But with a little bit of actual care to the domain-specific fizz, we were able to get something actually comprehensive. And I got lots more of these examples because I got lots of groups. Um, there's one more thing I want to show you before I run out of time, which I think is the most interesting thing here. Um, this crowd, I think, will appreciate that a language level is not the same as uh, taking away some operators, that there's a little bit more work involved in that. right? In particular, uh, it's really easy to forget that your error messages also betray the underlying abstraction that everybody is working in. Alloy is unapologetically relational. And so even if in class I, I jump up and down and I say functions, functions, objects, objects, uh, they're going to get an error and the error is going to say something like relational join was necessarily empty or something like that. Not very, not very helpful to me. So uh, starting uh, last, last spring, we actually added this language level uh, in earnest with custom error messages. So one potential error that I might have seen, uh, I, I actually made when I was transliterating this from Alloy. I'm not going to step through like the, the, the details of why this should give an error, but it turns out that there's sort of a, a like I'm trying to talk about a field as if it were an object. Laptop, why? Why are you so slow? There we go. Um, <clears throat> cannot access field of non-object. Right? Suggestion, ensure you're accessing a field of an object. Mm -hmm. um, if I was not in the language level, uh, you, this might be an unfair example because I have, I have debugging information turned off, but, but we'll ignore that. Well, let's just look at the first line before I stop. Uh. Debugging information, sorry. Uh, join always results in an empty relation. What's a join? What's a relation? What does that mean? What's going on there? Right? And so with these better error messages, we're more able to stay sort of within the lines of the conversation that we're having with the class. Uh, just to close, I'm, I'm delighted to, to add that several people in the room here today have contributed to Forge. Uh, so I see Sorterwe, I see Andrew, uh, uh, I see Ben. Um, they're probably a couple other people out there. So thank you, the Racket people, for, for, for sort of convincing me to, to give this language level thing a try. I, I, I wasn't really a Racketeer before I started writing Forge, and I've been having a lot of fun. Uh, I don't know if I have to stop now or if anybody's going to make me have to think before I answer a question. I, I, either way, it's... It, it's just, thanks a lot, Tim McKinsey. Questions for Tim? Those error messages are so great. And it's always such a sticking point with new students when the error messages talk about terminology and concepts they don't know. And so this is really fantastic. Uh, so 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 I'm I'm so uh 
the, the, the comment, I think, was that these error messages are good in that they restrict the, the, the sort of epistemic domain that the students have to live in. I must confess that I selected this one in particular because it's the one that made the most sense. I, I, I don't feel that all our errors are in great shape yet, that they will be by the screen. Error messages are very hard. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, how is the actual constraint solving implemented? Oh, how's the actual constraint solving implemented? Uh, we essentially sort of squish the constraints down into a set solver. With Rosette? Uh, we don't use Rosette, and in fact, we don't even use SMT. So we are significantly more simplistic than that. If you, if you don't mind. Would using those things help? Uh, it would certainly help the expressive power in terms of what students can model. Damn it. <laughs> like wearing Teflon or something? Sorry. <laughs> right. Um, alloy and the Forge's integers, for instance, are just terrible. Um, however, there, there are sort of performance side effects in that, uh, for various reasons, the, the alloy sort of solving is really good at generating the sort of concrete instances that we tend to focus on in class. And the SMT solvers thus far, the translations have been worse. But, oh boy, I hope that they get better. Jason, another question? My question is Jason. Any other questions? I'm here tomorrow morning if anybody wants to talk. Thanks very much, then.